climate crisis military. The Peace Education Center has been resisting militarism for its 50 plus years of existence. Many, if not all board members have also been working to address the climate crisis as a fundamental notion of human security. Without a healthy biosphere, humans will not have to worry about a functioning society or economy. As I'm sure Jim will highlight, militarism is pouring an accelerant onto the global climate destabilization. They are not two separate crises. They are deeply interwoven. Our task is to better understand those relationships and then to work collectively to reimagine what real security looks like for the entire global family, especially for our children and grandchildren and the other species we share this marvelous home planet. Some call it a climate crisis, others a climate emergency. Regardless of our preferred terminology, we are, to borrow from the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at the fierce urgency of now. Tonight wouldn't happen without, of course, Dr. Jim Ryan, whom I will shortly introduce. But we also thank the Veterans for Peace and the Peace Education Center for sponsoring this event. A special shout out to Bruce Wheaton, who is the building manager here at UUNC, who makes our use of this space so accessible and welcoming. Uh, I also want to thank my fellow colleagues on the PEC board, uh, especially Tassin Sadar, who is managing the technology tonight, and Samantha Dillon for her work in promoting this event and her ongoing technical support. Mm -hmm. I am most generously blessed to have all of them as colleagues in this work. Now to properly introduce Jim Ryan, our speaker tonight. After serving in the U.S. Army from 1969 to 1973, Jim Ryan earned his PhD at the University of Miami's Rosenthal School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. For over three decades, Jim researched and published on topics in marine and environmental geology and the potential interactions of the U.S. petroleum industry to climate change. In 2020, he helped form the Veterans for Peace Climate Crisis and Militarism Project. During the 117th Congress, <clears throat> the Climate Change and Militarism Project helped draft, with Representative Barbara Lee from California, House Resolution 767, which calls on the Department of Defense to report and to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. More recently, Jim has participated in protests in Washington, DC, New York, and right here in Lansing, Michigan. In his spare time, Jim is also an adjunct professor in the Department of Environmental Science and Geology at Wayne State University in Detroit. Please welcome Dr. Jim Ryan. Uh, thank you, Terry. and. Uh... I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, at any point during the talk, you can hear me in the audience uh, in Lansing, please let me know. Uh, Terry, go ahead and put that first uh, image up, please. I'm assuming you're running the show since. Sure, or, give me one, or am I sharing the screen? Did you want to run the show or am I sharing the screen? My colleague, you, you can share the screen. Ah, uh, okay. That's a, that's a switch. So excuse me a minute while I pull it up. I thought that uh, you were going to run it, but okay. Excuse, excuse me for a second. Uh, let me go ahead and start with saying that this presentation isn't just me. It is uh, uh, effort of the uh, Climate Crisis and Militarism Project. And uh, it, uh, so let's see, share screen. Slideshow. Okay, you should have a light green screen to link between U.S. militarism and climate crisis, okay? Uh, so the talk outline is, we're, I'm going to state the problem, climate crisis, which you know quite about, quite a bit about, 
the links between U.S. militarism in that crisis, progress versus reality, and what can we do? Uh, now, Terry already mentioned who I am, so I won't go into detail. The picture on the lower left is me in uh, Pakistan uh, doing field work. Uh, the other photos are me before I get here, getting arrested in Lansing and, and down in Washington, D.C., where I figured that uh, maybe direct action is uh, a little more effective than just talking to folks. Where actions meet are louder than words, I suppose, or at least I'm trying, we're trying to get more attention since we're not getting all that much attention about this particular issue, the links between climate and militarism by just writing papers and giving talks, but whatever, whatever you know, we can do. Uh, okay, back in February of 2022, right as the Ukraine war was starting, the IPCC uh, came out with their climate change 2022 report. Uh, it was very depressing at the same time. These things seem to happen at the, the same time when uh, Guterres was saying it was code red for humanity. Humanity was starting to blow each other up instead of working cooperatively on climate change. Well, the diagram on the lower left essentially shows uh, emissions from 1990 to 2019. Uh, the blue is industrial CO2 emissions. As you can see, it's going up. Uh, on the left here is uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions in uh, gigatons, CO2 equivalent, so zero to 60. So this is annual. Uh, yellow is agricultural CO2. Uh, the red is methane. The black is nitrous oxide. And there's a little green band in there, which is the fluorocarbons. So things keep going up. There was a little dip here uh, coinciding with, uh, uh, let's see, one of the, uh, there's a dip here for the 2008 recession. Uh, this one was another economic dip. Uh, we haven't gotten COVID in here yet, but not only do the emissions keep going up, uh, they said that the emissions need to peak by 2025. So just two to three years from now, to avoid going over one and a half degrees uh, Celsius. This is a diagram from the recent report uh, by the IPCC that just came out, uh, like I said, uh, within the last month. And what this shows here is emissions in black, which is historical, going up to uh, about 2020 today or so. And then here is the, what it's projected to do under the implemented policies. So implement policies that have already been implemented. Now this came out, uh, what was it, March? So I'm assuming this might have the, uh, and I have to go back and look at this again, uh, should have the, uh, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, IRA in that. If, uh, if not, it's, uh, it's you know just the implemented policy before then, but with you know, the projections of what is by law by then by, by now, it's showing that emissions are not going to be going down that much. They're sort of stable, going out after about uh, uh, twenty forty. So down here is uh, two thousand to two twenty one hundred. The blue line is what the emission reductions that need to be. Uh, to get to 1.5 degrees at 2100. The green band is uh, two degrees. Uh, the shaded in areas are the ranges. Now there's another range here showing this is the nationally determined contributions, NDC, uh, the range in 2030. So here this is 2030. And depending upon if these nationally determined contributions are uh, implemented or not is what, whether we're up here or whether we're down closer to two degrees. So what are NDCs? So again, it's the nationally determined contribution of each country uh, that attended the Glasgow conference, so about 190 countries. Uh, there are unconditional uh, uh, NDCs and there's conditional NDCs. Now, what is the difference? 
An unconditional contribution is what a country could implement based on its own resources. So it doesn't need help from anybody else. Conditional contribution is one which countries could would undertake if international means of support are provided or other conditions are met. Now there's a registry of all these uh, uh, NDCs and you can, uh, the website's down here and I'll remind my folks, you can, you can email me and I can send you the references or you can just go to, uh, for this talk, or you can go to uh, uh, the website, the uh, uh, Michigan Peace uh, Alliance website and my, my uh, email is there and I can send you the references. But the NDC re registry, you can look up each country. I'm just gonna look for example, Angola. Now they're unconditional NDC. They're promising, and this is by 2025, to lower their baseline, which is, I think it's from 2019, their baseline emissions uh, by uh, almost 16,000 uh, 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 kilotons. So uh, 16,000 kilotons, uh, but their conditional NDC, if they get help in the way of money or uh, grants uh, or maybe uh, technologies, uh, they can get down to uh, over 26,000 tons. So a, a, a 10,000 uh, gigaton difference between almost double with their uh, conditional uh, NDC. Now, why should we help you know, why should we even care about uh, these developing countries like Angola? And, uh, going back here, this is Angola down here, uh, closer to the, well, relatively close to the equator, but uh, a southern latitude, uh, uh, southern hemisphere countries uh, in, on this particular map. And what is this map? This map is from a study by Burke in, uh, I think it's 2019. And he looked at, uh, what would happen if uh, emissions continued uh, without uh, very much abatement, so business as usual, and what would happen to various economies? This wasn't a model. He had actually looked at uh, changes in productivity, per capita productivity, or uh, uh, cap, uh, per capita GDP of a particular country when temperature went up from one year to another. Then he extrapolated that out based on the models of what temperatures would be, and uh, this is what he came up with. Uh, the average decrease in the global GDP would be 23% by the year uh, 2100. Now the range, some countries shown in blue would actually have a increase in their GDP. So uh, this is the scale here. Uh, the, the blue would be 100% increase. So it would go up. Uh, 100% decreases in red. And you can see here the lower latitudes around the equator in the Southern hemisphere, uh, their GDP would drop uh, much more in comparison to, to Russia. This is one of the reasons why Vladimir Putin doesn't seem to care uh, about climate change all that much. Now, the reason why Alaska shows up pink uh, along with continental United States is this was done on a country by country basis. So why is this taking place? Well, this is another diet. So this is that diagram I was showing. Uh, so heat and humidity, this is from the report, the IPCC report that just came out a, a month or so ago. And this is uh, increases in temperature. So these are days that it's too hot to work, a risk, risk heat, humidity, risk to human health. And uh, this is one day versus, uh, that's a, up to 300, so every day. So this is the average temperature going up 1.7 degrees. You can see these high numbers are located in the lower latitudes and in the Southern hemisphere. Uh, they do extend when you get out to four degrees Celsius or uh, plus five, but they're really impacted in these low latitude regions. So essentially what is, the, the lower latitude regions are going to be impacted a lot more than the higher latitude countries, uh, the northern than the northern hemisphere, the northern hemisphere has more land mass in the high latitude, so they're not as impacted. 
Okay, this is this was uh, left over from a talk I gave to Nazareth University. I think most of you folks know this, which country emits the most greenhouse gases currently and historically. Well, this is a diagram I saw in the Washington Post. This is annual emissions. Of course, China has the highest emissions now. So this is 2000. Uh, here, this is uh, 2020. Uh, so China is much more, whoops, much higher than, uh, whoops, much higher than the US. But this is the per capita. We're still higher. And we're even projected out to, to 2050. Uh, the US is still per capita going to be higher than China. China. China will be higher than Europe. Okay, cumulative emissions. It won't be until 2050 that China actually catches up with us as far as cumulative emissions. And about 2030 or so, they'll catch up with Europe. So historically, we're still the biggest emitter. Now, this talk is about militarism and climate change. Uh, this is a diagram from uh, uh, Inside Climate News and essentially shows, I know you can't read most of these, but uh, this is for, uh, uh, I think it's 2019. Uh, no, 2019, so uh, China is the largest emitter. Uh, United States is second, India is third. Now, if you ranked of the Department of Defense uh, as a country, it would rank uh, 54th. So, I mean, still ranks with uh, North Korea, Belarus, Greece, Peru. It, it ranks as a country on its own. In fact, it is the number one institutional emitter in, in the world, institutional emitter. But that's just looking at what is known as scope one. So direct emissions from our military. So the airplanes and the ships, fugitive emissions, uh, some use of uh, explosives. Uh, scope two, so the scope one, scope two, and scope three. Scope two is uh, like power that is uh, given to bases from uh, power plants and things like that. Scope three is uh, industries that build the tanks and uh, purchase goods for the and, and building construction, transportation, uh, things like that. Three plus, which is unique to military, is like the excess fuels for the naval vessels, uh, construction, forest fires, damage of infrastructure with all the bombing and stuff and all these things. So this adds extra to military. And of course, all industries have like scope two and scope three uh, uh, things too. But if you if you add the essentially the war industry to the Department of Defense, you're gonna more than triple the emissions with which puts it up around about, uh, oh, say 20th to 35th. So we're up there with, uh, uh, the Nether Netherlands, which is the home of Royal Dutch Shell, uh, Poland, Vietnam, places like that. So this is what we should really consider. Why is there such a range? Uh, well, that, that scope diagram came from uh, uh, the conflict environment uh, in an environmental in conflict and environment observatory over in the UK. And their estimates are that uh, uh, the scope three and scope two actually uh, uh, is more than triple. It is like five times the admission. So that's why the range. I'm using the more cons conservative range from Nita Crawford, who estimated that uh, the war industry uh, during the war on terror was uh, twice the amount than the U.S. military. So when you add the military, then that's three times the admission. Now, why is the military so high? This is just one example. I had mentioned before that it's the largest institutional consumer of oil uh, and emitter of CO2. Uh, one reason why is you know, we have big toys that we play with. So this beef, like a B-52, for instance, uh, emits in one hour more uh, emissions than seven cars do in a year, the average car. So seven cars or one car driving for seven years. Uh, and then that's one plane. The U.S. military 
uh, has the world's largest military aircraft fleet, over 13,000. That's uh, three times more than Russia and uh, four times more than China. So not all these airplanes are in the air all the time, but then Russia's are in the air all the time either. Uh, so we have a big fleet and we emit a lot of, of CO2. We also have lots of bases uh, over, well, we have a, between 750 and 800 bases. We're building more, uh, you know, with this conflict in, uh, in uh, uh, Ukraine. And now we're all worried about China. We're building more bases. And uh, uh, how many bases does China have? Well, they have less than 10. Uh, Russia, it has about 21 bases. Over, these are overseas bases. So you could you could see why Vladimir Putin, uh, you know, we outspend him, which I'll go into next, and uh, we're he's you know bases all around in China the same way, uh, you know, but we're worried that China is making more bases, and so and you know Russia is adding, adding maybe a base here or two. It's it's really ridiculous. We have far more bases than anybody else in the world. And we spend more. This is uh, from uh, 2021. Uh, our budget of uh, $800 billion was almost three times that of China, uh, larger than India. Russia, we're about 12 times more. And that coincides with top greenhouse gas emitters for the, for the globe. China's number one, USA number two, India's number three, Russia's number four. We see a lot of these a lot of EU countries here. Uh, their per capita emissions are lower, so they don't get in this top emitter category, but still they spend a lot on their military. So we spend more, we have a larger, we have a spend more, so we have a larger military, we have more bases. It's, it's a, a lot of emissions. Is this really what we should be doing? Again, looking at the money, this is what Biden proposed, proposed for the FY 2022 budget. It was half military here shown in blue. Uh, and the rest, this was the rest back here. Uh, of course, Congress in its wisdom increased that budget to uh, $778 billion, even though Pentagon didn't ask for it. And of course, next year it even got bigger. Now, half this money goes to contractors. Uh, you know, people say, well, we can't lower the budget because look at those the poor troops and sailors. Well, the average military salary is 61000 That's not what a sailor makes or a private first class, but you have to average in the generals. And so defense industry, it's about 90000 This is as of 2021. As of 2020, the CEOs of like Boeing and General Dynamics, Raytheon, they were raking in. Uh, on an average of $22 million a year. So they're the ones, in my opinion, in the opinion of the Climate Crisis and Militarism Project, are perhaps driving our military expansion uh, more than uh, the threats overseas, because uh, they like getting their, their benefits. Uh, since, uh, and let me add that, okay, so in the 800 billions of dollars, but when you add the VA, and you add the uh, Department of Defense's part of the uh, national debt. You have to pay the interest rate on that on the national debt. Their portion, the number actually comes, and then you put in Homeland Security and things like that. You actually get over a trillion dollars. And this was for, uh, I think, the FY twenty uh, twenty uh, analysis by. Uh, the uh, Nation magazine. And, you know, this really didn't stop major threats to the United States, like uh, a million people being killed by COVID-19. I, I like political cartoons. So a large budget the DOD has, of which they have never passed an audit, uh, and then these extra costs that don't, that aren't really talked about, like the national debt. So since 9-11, we've actually spent $6.4 trillion on war. So in the past two decades, when, when people like Senator Manchin say, well, we can't afford to, you know, uh, spend money on uh, uh, renewable energy. Uh, 
This is from the National Priority Project. They estimate that we could have gone 100% renewable energy for $4.5 trillion. So we could have done it for the same amount of money we spent on the military and still had some uh, change left to uh, help healthcare and education and things like that. Uh, and then also, but again, I meant I'll say this again, uh, a lot of the money being spent on the military instead of things like climate change is being driven by the industry itself. Uh, the industry spent over a billion dollars since uh, 2001 uh, on lobbying uh, Congress to get more money. Now, sort of wrap this up with a, a good, the good, I call it the good, the bad, and the ugly. Where are we at now? Uh, so the good. Uh, Biden passed the sweeping climate health care and tax bill, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act in 2022. So the IRA of 2022, with climate provisions of $669 billion for 10 years. Okay. So that's, I, I'm a geologist, I'm not very good at math, but if I divide that you know, 369 by 10, I get about $37 billion a year. Now the NDAA for FY23 was $857.9 billion. So what we're spending on climate is 1 23rd per year of what we're spending on war. Uh, based on my, my experience as a geologist and looking at climate change in the rock record, personally, I'm more worried about climate change than I'm worried about Russia and China. So uh, we can negotiate with, uh, with poor Putin, maybe not right away, and we can negotiate with China, but we can't neg negotiate with mother nature. It's physics. Now, another, this is a good thing. Okay, so uh, Terry had mentioned that uh, we had worked with uh, Representative Barbara Lee for her to submit a, a resolution to have the Pentagon report its admissions and to come up with a plan. And this is to support what actually was being passed into law. Now the Net NDAA is the National Defense Authorization Act comes up every year, big arguments about how much money we should spend. Usually it's people are arguing extensive, unless people like uh, 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 Rashida Tlaib and uh, Barbara Lee, they argue for less money. Uh, but even Bernie Sanders, you know, is not opposed to spending more money. But in these huge documents, uh, which thankfully they come out in the PDF so you can do word searches, I found uh, paragraphs that, that in the FDAA for 2021 requires the Secretary of Defense to submit to Congress a report on greenhouse gas emissions for the, each of the next 10 fiscal, or each of the last 10 fiscal years. Now, whereas the resolution with Barbara Lee was a pretty please do this, these are actual laws that cannot be changed until somebody passes another law. Uh, like if I'm correct, uh, there was laws back in old NDAAs that said Pentagon doesn't have to submit reports. So this supersedes that. In the FY 2022 NDAA, uh, there was a in there was inserted, like I said, in this thousand page document, just a couple of paragraphs saying that the Pentagon has to submit uh, plans by September. Uh, uh, of 2022, last year, uh, to Congress to reduce greenhouse gas emissions for the Department of Defense. Now, also, which I didn't put in here, they also had to come up with researching their scope two and scope three emissions also. So that's in there, but they just had to generate plans on how to do that. So this is a good thing. And sure enough, uh, the Army came up with a plan in February of last year where they said they were going to be net zero by 2050, fully electric tactical vehicles. I mean, those big tanks are going to be all electric, all these good things. Uh, so net zero, all army by 2050. The Navy came up with a similar plan, reduce uh, scope one uh, and two greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, net zero by 2050. Yay, good news. 
Uh, the Air Force is a little more realistic. They said, uh, we like the idea, but they didn't really come up with any specifics, no deadlines, no anything like that. They supported, but more training and research is what they were proposing. Now, the Air Force is responsible for 45% of the military's emissions. But let me point out that all these, these great plans, there's, there was sort of a caveat, like net zero. The caveat is it's based on uh, executive orders. And, uh, and uh, also, uh, so and we all know that executive orders change with the executive. So let's say if a Donald Trump-like person came in, he could change the executive order. Also, the net zero uh, targets were to the maximum extent practical and without compromising national security. That's a big caveat. That's a big what if or a what or whatever. So I'm not all that, uh, you know, I don't think that's, I, I have my doubts. I take this with a big grain of salt. Especially when I looked at the recent NDAA for F fiscal year 2023 that just came out. So this is a there's there is a renewal of annual environmental and energy reports. So they're continuing the reports. That's good news. But as far as the actually implementing what the Navy, the Army had put in, there's only pilot programs on sustainable aviation fuel. So that's the only tactical money that's in there. All the rest are pilot programs on developing charging solutions uh, domestically for uh, you know uh, domestic vehicles or you know non tactical vehicles. There's actually provisions in there that limit the purchasing of non tactical vehicle non tactical vehicles uh, with electric. So. They can't go willy nilly and buy a whole bunch, whole bunch of these. So there's actually provisions on on stopping wholesale purchase, and then a study of federal federal uh, fleet vehicles that, that should be finished within three years, not later than three years. So I don't see the provisions here uh, following up on their plans. Now the bad, uh, the bad is. Uh, now, I mentioned the uh, NDCs and the money that the countries needed. Uh, so Biden in, in Glasgow, what was that, COP25, he promised uh, $11.4 billion to be given annually to this fund that would help these developing countries. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 had zero money in there. Of course, that was... I suppose domestically, but the omnibus bill that also passed had only one billion dollars in it for this fund that Biden had promised. So, meanwhile, the NDAA for FY 2023 had 857 billion dollars. So, one to 857. So, again, uh, I'm more worried about climate change than I'm worried about. Uh, China and Russia, and I think money put to uh, helping these countries lower their emissions and getting this line closer to two degrees would be much more helpful for our security than buying more weapons, especially with you know redoing our nuclear arsenal. That's even ridiculous. And I won't go into Ukraine all that much, but it's not helping this situation. I think the major thing that it's doing is this decreasing cooperation among nations, and we need to have more cooperation. Now, this is the real ugly part of this the talk. Climate change and immigration and militarism. One of the side effects, and this is a quote from uh, Todd Miller. <clears throat> I think it's in his book, Storming the Wall, which I highly recommend. Just like super typhoons, rising seas, heat waves, border buildup, and militarization are byproducts, of climate change. So this is a very good cartoon. Essentially, it's, you know what we're doing on the southern border. Uh, so th this diagram here is from the National Priority Projects uh, paper, No Warming, No War, which I recommend. 
Again, very ugly. The U.S., the most polluting country, spends the most on keeping, keeping climate refugees out. And until the Biden administration, we were spending 10 times more on border protection than on climate finance. So let me wrap, wrap this up uh, with what we can do. So when you're talking to folks about climate change, mention militarism because it is an important part that can't be forgotten. Uh, and again, you know, uh, go to exploring the issues in our, our webpage. You can go to our Militarism and Climate Project webpage, uh, go to explore the issues. Uh, urge major cuts from the Pentagon uh, budget. Uh, Rashida Tlaib is already in, in on that with the uh, people over the Pentagon with Barbara, Barbara Lee. Uh, so we can, you know, they're just urging, I think, a uh, hundred billion dollar getting dropped from the from the Pentagon. But we don't need to keep increasing it. We need to, to lower it. Promote this presentation to others. We have a we have a crew. Like I said, this is not just my presentation. It's it's the whole uh, project. And don't let the Democrats or the Republicans off the hook on this. Uh, we have brochures. We have bumper stickers. If anybody wants a bumper sticker, happy to send it, send it to you. Uh, get involved in demonstrations. Uh, we won't have any air shows in the area except Traverse City. Uh, that's a good opportunity to protest because that is a real waste of uh, emissions. And talk to environmental groups. Like I said, if you are talking to environmental groups, uh, tell them about uh, uh, militarism and its effect on climate change. And we are making some progress. Back in 2016, I was on the Hill with Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, the Sunrise, uh, Sunrise Movement was not talking about militarism. Uh, back in 2022, November of last year, we had some Sunrise people at this demonstration in Washington, uh, 350.org, Sierra Club, uh, other folks, uh, Extinction Rebellion are getting involved. Uh, with this particular issue, but we need to get more more involved. And other countries are looking to us since we have the largest uh, military uh, and we are also historically the largest emitter. A project that I'm uh, sort of initiated, uh, this is uh, Pentagon and Climate Change and War. I think Terry is reading it now by uh, uh, Professor Anita Crawford from uh, the Cost of War Project. It's sort of goes historically uh, how the Pentagon and uh, the, uh, the Department of War turned into the Department of Defense uh, has been following fossil fuels since its inception, since you know, almost the beginning of the United States where we, we started to use fossil fuels. I've given this book with to uh, my representative, uh, uh, Sri Tandahar. We've also had a follow-up meeting uh, about militarism and climate change. I've given the book to Senator Peters. I highly recommend that uh, folks in the Lansing area meet with uh, Alyssa Slotkin uh, as, her, as a representative. And but since she seems to be the uh, front runner on uh, the Senate, uh, we need to, uh, to meet with her. And I'd be happy to join you in a meeting with uh, uh, Representative Slotkin. So, with that, I'll, I'll end and I'm happy to, to take discussion, you know, discuss this uh, talk with you further. And again, please uh, contact me. I'll put in my, the chat my, uh, uh, my uh, uh, email and I can send you the links to, uh, to the references for this talk. Thank you. Silence. Did I stop sharing? No, okay. you can speak now. Thank you, Jim. Um, we'll entertain questions probably uh, for those else uh, coming in on Zoom, put them in the chat and can you retrieve those then? Yeah. yeah. Um, I learned a few things from this, and I'm someone who follows this pretty, pretty much uh, all the time. Matter of fact, there was just a, an article today published by Michael Clare 
uh, in Tom Dispatch. Uh, one of the elements that, in this article that he's talking about is the increasing push for military spending, especially into uh, the research into autonomous weapons, uh, hypersonic weapons, and all the tools that go with this, and the effect of brain drain uh, that's being pulled from other areas like addressing climate change because there's so much money coming into universities and research centers to do this, uh, this kind of research. Jim, do you, do you have any thoughts about the, that whole element of the militarism and the climate change? Well, the military has been planning for climate change for decades. Uh, not only have they acknowledged it, but they're, they're thinking of it more as a, uh, uh, maybe an opportunity or a threat, and they're doing more adaptation than they are, uh, well, they're greenwashing. Uh, they're wanting to use, uh, which is, I mean, they wanna, they wanna be independently powered on their bases, that's good. Uh, with uh, you know solar panels and things like that, uh, but there's there's a few quotes in Anita Crawford's book that uh, you know if if the military the military cannot be thought as a leader in this particular uh, uh, endeavor of uh, leading the United States into uh, uh, sustainability. Uh, for one thing, I mean, they, they could do that, but it'd be so expensive. The most economic and efficient way to lower their emissions is to decrease the size of the military. Uh, and uh, I, I'm, I'm looking uh, for a, there was a, you know, who are the friends? Uh, Bob uh, Earhart had a question. There, there is a, uh, Barbara Lee has a, with uh, uh, Mark Pocan, has a, uh, uh, a bill to lower Pentagon emissions by, uh, I think it's $100, $100 billion. So I'm sure you can't get Alyssa Slotkin to sign on, but I was talking to Sri Tanahar to see if he would sign on as a co-sponsor. So on that particular bill, it's not a resolution, it's a bill, but uh, or I have to go back and check, make sure that's it is a bill. But uh, I'll see if I can find that during the end of this talk, before this talk ends. Did I did I answer your question, or was I looking in my chat and got confused? You did you did well, Jim. I think also um, we have a couple other reps from Michigan: Debbie Dingle, Rashida, and I think uh, Kildee. Uh, in the past have voted for at least holding firm on increases in defense spending. Um, they probably are some of the, the closer ones to it, but clearly we have a lot of work to do with uh, potentially our future Senate candidate to replace Debbie Stabenow uh, in terms of that. Uh, are well, there any questions from the, the folks here in the room that they want to ask well, before we get back to the chat? Okay, I can I can ask all kinds of questions. Um, where in your last slide, you were showing some uh, opportunities, what we can do. Um, and if we look at the curves that you're showing us about the, uh, as you said, the the March report from the IPCC said we had to reduce uh, emissions, greenhouse gas emissions globally by fifty percent. Uh, the way I calculated it, in eighty months. Um, and that's the global reduction. It has to be, given the justice issues, uh, much more substantial for the developed countries, which have the burden of having placed, placed the burden on the developing world. So uh, one of the things I've been struggling with is how, how can we address in a consuming culture to consume less? Because it seems to me there's supply and there's demand. Uh, you can cut demand, uh, then the supply 
uh, could slide down a little lower uh, in terms of what we have. Any, uh, any ideas on any of that? Well, before I luckily found, or, you know, a group of folks within Veterans for Peace that wanted to really stress the militarism and climate change. I was working with uh, Citizens Climate Lobby to try and get a, a tax on carbon emissions, which would hopefully drive people into smaller houses and smaller cars and things like that. Uh, but nobody seems to want to do that in either party. So, and then uh, January 6th came along when I was saying, if there should be any red flag rules, it should be on the United States of America, because why does the United States, you know, have this almost get taken over by a crazy man? Well, they're all, I think anybody runs for president has to be a little bit crazy in the head, but at any rate, a real crazy man with Donald Trump, uh, they, we shouldn't be having the biggest military. So I really de decided to devote myself to this. And as being a veteran, I, I'm i stressing that the militarism and, and the climate crisis, because I, I have some credibility as having served in the military. Uh, I, I, we need to do things individually. I try and take a train as much as possible. I mean, I haven't flown. I try and stay off of planes. Uh, of course, I live alone, so I keep my heat down and uh, uh, try and you know, conserve individually, but the, the individually. But we're gonna have to impact Congress. We're, we're trying to do some more direct actions. Uh, this, uh, this year, uh, coinciding with uh, the uh, UN General Assembly. That one of the things uh, that I didn't, didn't stress, but I did mention there is a group called CEOPS, it's, uh, or Con uh, Conflict and, Envir and, and en Environmental Observatory. Uh, and we're working on this too, is to get uh, the United States to in all countries to report their military emissions in their nationally declared contributions. So putting their reduction targets, but also their report their emissions of their militaries to the IPCC. So do this just like, instead of just lumping it in there as an obscure number uh, to report the military emissions. So the whole world can see this. Now, I mentioned that uh, we had this resolution and that there was a law passed that uh, the Department of Defense has to uh, report their admissions, but it's not readily accessible. And until somebody I know leaked it to a reporter, uh, there, it was not accessible at all uh, to the general public, and it's still it's an obscure article in Inside Climate News. Uh, but uh, they're they're not broadcasting this. In fact, in the Kyoto during the in the Toyota Toyota Kyoto meeting, uh, where they came up with the Kyoto Protocols of reducing emissions and all that, uh, we went over there and specifically made. The UN say we didn't have to, nobody had to report military admissions. And people that were really all thought this was great that, that, that we were, our ambassadors were able to do that were John Kerry and Joe Biden. Uh, now, Joe's changed a little bit and supposedly Kerry has changed too, but they never met. They never mentioned military admissions. Uh, we had a meeting with John Kerry's staff right after he took they took office uh, and saying, you know, we wanted to approach this and could we talk to them about this? You know, we have not been able to get another meeting with them. Uh, if, if you know of Kerry mentioning our military admissions, 
please send me the link to it because as far as I know, he has not done it. It's just a taboo topic. Uh, so that's, I'm doing this. Other people need to talk to their Congress people. And the, where the military comes in is, hey, uh, we're spending all this money on the military. We should spend it on climate or healthcare or education. Uh, why spend it on this foolishness? Uh, like we're spending more on upgrading our uh, atomic weapons, our nuclear weapons than we are uh, annually on uh, climate change in the IRA. We need more nuclear weapons. I mean, really? That, that's where you need to, need to stress this to, to your members of Congress, president, you know, it's all our politi politi you know, elected officials. They're not getting money from the federal government because we're spending it on the military. Thank you, Jim. Well, I'm going to throw one more question at you before we let you go. Uh, you mentioned a book that you've been giving away to S S Senator Peters and to Representative Thanedar, uh, and uh, I was meaning to get to that book, and you've inspired me to go get it. I started reading it this morning, and one of the things that stood out early on in the book is something you mentioned about the role of the uh, military industrial complex and their emissions, which I believe she indicates is uh, a multiple factor of what the military itself uh, puts out in terms of emissions. Um, there's a question from Bob Barnhart, he threw in chat, that gets to this. Do you, are you aware of anything going on in that sector that is uh, pushing reduction at that end? Well, again, uh, in the FY 2022 NDAA, uh, there is, uh, and Bob, you can email me and I can send you the, the, the paragraph or so, uh, but there is, uh, the Department of Defense has been told that they need to set up a study group to or a research group need to hire an outside firm to research the best way to uh, uh, monitor emissions uh, for their contractors. Now, NATO uh, June of last year actually said that all the NATO members have said that we need, you know, we need to come up with a plan, and NATO is. Uh, coming together to come up with a plan uh, on how to monitor emissions and then supposedly come up with a plan on how to lower emissions. Uh, but they're keeping what this is very tight to the vest, this CEOPS organization, which again is based in the UK and does mostly NATO, NATO work, not just the US, uh, NATO. They're trying to get, uh, they, they've come up with their own ideas, but they're not getting any feedback from uh, from NATO. So they're out there, but you know, we're worried that uh, there, there's a lot of greenwashing going on. Thank you very much. Before people run off uh, to do the other things and they're important in your lives, I uh, want to remind you that next Tuesday, the 25th, Greater Atlanta United Nations Association Peace Education Center and several. You just hit mute, Terry. I'm the only one that's not muted. Did I do something? Okay, try it again. Okay, now can you hear me? Yes. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, this it was a great monologue you missed. Sorry. <laughs> uh, 
Now, I'm just reminding people that uh, next week on Tuesday, we're continuing this conversation about climate change uh, with a program uh, sponsored by the Greater Lansing United Nations Association, Peace Education Center, the Islamic Center of uh, Greater Lansing, and a couple of other organizations uh, whose uh, mind, who's slipped my mind at the moment, and I apologize to them. Uh, focusing on the climate justice issue, uh, it'll be a presentation by uh, uh, Professor Roger Gottlieb, who is a uh, professor of philosophy uh, from Boston, uh, who's been writing on this topic for a long time about the, the moral and ethical issues that we must consider, especially given all the information that Jim just showed us about the disparities and where this climate is and where the action has to take place. So hopefully you can join us then. I, I thank you for joining us tonight. I thank Jim very much, not simply for his presentation tonight, but for the work that he continues to do and lead with the Veterans for Peace nationally. He's an inspiration to us, uh, the Michigan uh, Peace Alliance, for which he's going to become an active member. So you, you, uh, let's let's give him a hand somehow or other. Thumbs up on the screen. Across here in the room. Uh, take care of yourself. Definitely a big trip. Thank you for the opportunity again. And I just, can I just put in a little promo? The, the Golden Rule, which is a Veterans for Peace ship or a boat that uh, sailed into uh, the Marshall Islands uh, back in the 50s or tried to, has been resurrected by Veterans for Peace. It's going to be coming through Michigan uh, in, uh, in August. We'll be in Detroit the 13th through the 17th. And they want to come out to uh, to Lansing on the uh, on the fifteenth. So, if folks are interested, they would just soon have like two sessions. And if anybody is interested in in hosting, uh, uh, talking about their mission to lower nuclear threats, please let me know. But thank you very much for this opportunity. Bye.